our topic this morning, we, what we want to talk about is the question on the screen before you, what must I do to be saved? And that stems from the theme of a refuge from the storm. We look at the turmoil, the crazy world around us, the things we see going on in the Middle East, the things we see in the Ukraine, the things we see in our backyard with the politicians and the mess of this world. It's a crazy world we live in. And it's contrary to what the world would want us to believe. It is getting worse, not better. So as we see the storm around us, the question comes to mind, what must I do to be saved from this storm? And that's the consideration we want to spend some time together. The scriptural answer, what must we do to be saved? That's the purpose of our time together. And when you sincerely ask that question, it definitely means something. When, the, when your mind is wondering, what must we do to be saved? We turn to scripture and we say, what is the answer? And our mind will be absorbed with scripture and we will learn the requirements. We will learn the truth that God has caused to be written in his word. A sincerely asking mind, what must I do to be saved? will learn that man is mortal, that we're going to die. And that any hope of incorruption, any hope from deviating from that path is conditional, conditional. There are things that must be done to be saved. And that mind that asks will strongly and sincerely ask, what are those conditions? What must I do? And then hopefully there'll be a strong desire to actually do what is asked, what is required. So what must we do to be saved? If it's asked, then we want to be ready to respond. And the one who actually answers the question has every right to set up whatever conditions they want to set up. So sincerely asking the question is an admission that we have no natural claim to salvation inherent. It's not something we can do ourselves to obtain salvation. And the one who gives can set the conditions. The giver has every right to set those conditions. In the willing mindset of Luke 18, verse 17 says, Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter there. And that's the proper mindset when coming to find this answer. It's as, as if you're going to your father saying, Dad, help me. And the dad says, this is what you have to do. Then the, the mind of the child will say, that's what I'm going to do. And that's exactly the relationship we need to have with our Heavenly Father. We say, what do we need to do to be saved? We say, Father, what do we need to do? And he answers it in his word. The mind of a child will say, I'm going to do it. So that's what we want to answer this afternoon together. And that's not the character of the preachers in the world around us, the critics. They criticize the gospel, which Romans 1.16 tells us, the gospel is the power of salvation for believers. The power to save is bound up in that gospel. So the truth of the matter differs very greatly from the cunningly devised fables you'll hear from the world around us. The world around us peddles many cunningly devised fables. The core, the root of everything is the fact that man is mortal and man is in need Man needs help to be otherwise. This simple doctrine, man is mortal and needs help to be otherwise, it has opposition. There's an opposition found in the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. The serpent at the beginning says, thou shalt not surely die. And that's a cunningly devised fable that many in the world around teach. 
This doctrine of the immortality of the soul, it sets up two paths before you. It's either eternal torture or eternal bliss. That's what the doctrine of the immortality of the soul teaches. And it's absolutely unimaginable that myriads of harmless good people will suffer forever because of... It's just, how can you imagine suffering eternally, the eternally, what, you know, forever, whatever that word would be, right? Eternally. Thank you, Brother Bob. How could you suffer? I mean, and then you think about, all right, how many people are going to be in heaven and how many are going to be in hell? Who's winning? The people going to heaven or the people going to hell? Right? So these, this absolutely illogical conclusion leads to the belief that morality alone can save. That's the, that's the only way to get the balance back. And that's, again, this is a cunningly devised fable. You're not going to die. So what do we do with all these people? Right? It's, it's absolutely illogical. Some actually go so far as to, to continue down this path and say, well, all are saved. Everybody eventually is going to be saved. And, and it's like, well, what says the scriptures? You can't just dream up whatever you want. That's like the, the son going to the father saying, help me. And the father saying, or here's a better example. You're on the Titanic. It's going down. It's sinking. You're saying, what must I do to be saved? Well, you need to get on a lifeboat. That's what you need to do. Well, how about I... You know what? I'm just going to do ten jumping jacks, and I'll be saved. That's because that's what I want to do. And that's the cunningly devised fable. Make up whatever you want to do, and you'll be saved. And that's what these cunningly devised fables do. They don't adhere to what the Scripture says we have to do to be saved. So sincerely asking has to be followed up with a desire to do, to perform what is required. So the situation is revealed in heaven, the true situation. It's revealed in Romans 5 and 12. It's on the screen before you. As by one man sin entered the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. So what's that telling us? Mortals are incapable of elevating themselves and they must listen to the apostles. Morality alone. Morality, for morality's sake, it cannot save. The Bible teaches us that Jesus Christ was sent to open the way. He opened the way and he sent apostles to tell how that way can be entered in. How do we enter into life? Because we realize we're mortal. We need to be saved. Jesus came to show us that way. Is there a better method? Is there a better method than the one that God has established? The answer to the question, what must we do to be saved? The way of life was opened. Is there a better method of sharing the answer to that question. Belief comes by hearing. Right? Acts 11 verses 13 and 14. If you have your Bible, let's go ahead and turn to Acts 11, 13 and 14. We're going to have to pick up the pace. But Acts 11, 13 and 14. This is the story of... Um, Cornelius calling for Simon. Now the name of Simon means hearing, which is a theme that we're going to hear over the next couple minutes. Hearing. So Acts eleven thirteen, and he had sent an angel when he, and had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa and call Simon the hearer, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell the words, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. So he's got to go and get the words whereby thou and thy house may be saved, shall be saved. And then Acts 16, flip over a few pages to Acts 16, starting at verse 29. 
Then he called for, oh, I'm sorry, I'm shifting gears on you here, but um, Acts 16 is talking about Paul and Silas being in the prison and the Philippian jailer asking, Sirs, what must I do to be saved in verse 30? And he said, the answer, verse 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord. So it's not just simply believing. Now you have to hear what the word of the Lord is and all that were in the house. And they rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. So how do you believe in him if you haven't heard? And what is belief? Belief is faith. And obviously faith is something more than just a warm feeling of trust. Faith is much more than that scripturally. Faith, we're told, is the substance of hope. It's the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence. So faith is based on things that we can prove, things that we believe. How do we believe anything? We hear it. You can't believe on something you haven't heard. So how do we believe if you haven't heard? We must believe the gospel. Romans 10 verses 12 through 15 tells us, The same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? Or had faith? How shall they believe? How shall they have faith in him whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm past that, aren't I? <laughs> I skipped a slide. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. Bring glad tidings of good things. They bring the gospel. How beautiful are those feet? that bring the gospel. And what that's telling us is there has to be a knowledge before belief. There has to be a knowledge before faith. You can't just have, oh, I have faith that uh, you know, 10 jumping jacks are going to save me from the sinking Titanic. I just have faith. I had a warm, fuzzy feeling in my bed last night. and I'm good. No, you have to know, first, that you need to be saved. Second, what... You have to have faith in the fact that salvation is available and there is a way. You have to know what the gospel is. There is good news. Right? So we have to believe the gospel. So upon realization of that fact, the question has to come to mind, well, what is the gospel? We have to know this before we can believe it. You have to know what the gospel is to believe the gospel. So what is the gospel? Again, scripturally, we want the Bible's answer to what the gospel, the good news is. Faith is critical in this fact. There is, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And there is only one faith, we're told in Ephesians. There's only one way. And as I, read, as I mentioned earlier, without faith, actually I didn't mention this. This is in Hebrews 11 also. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So that's what our faith is based in. And without faith, faith it's impossible. There's only one faith. That faith is in the one who can save us. And we're told in... In Ephesians 2, verse 8, which is an excellent memory verse, we should all remember this because it's for by grace ye are saved through faith. What must I do to be saved? You are saved through faith, says Ephesians. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we're told in Hebrews 10, now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So faith, again, is the belief in something very specific. That faith is belief in the gospel. Specifics. We see this in Abraham's life. 
In Romans 4, we're, we're told that he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was fully persuaded. You're fully persuaded by those things that you know. You can't be fully persuaded if you don't know something. Unbelief. So he did not stagger at the promise of God. God made specific promises. And Abraham was fully persuaded that what he promised he was able to perform. So Abraham, again, is the father of the faithful. And so scriptural faith is based in belief in God's promises. So what is the gospel? The gospel which must be believed. We have to believe to have faith in it. We have to know what it is to have faith in it. What is the gospel? The gospel, which must be believed to obtain salvation, it's made up chiefly of unfulfilled promises. God promised something. I will do this. And we have faith that he will do it. That's part of the gospel. We have to have faith in that gospel. So let's look at some of the specific details scripturally of, of the gospel. There are two parts to the gospel. And Acts 8 and 12 tells us the two parts of that gospel. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, two things, they were baptized both men and women. So the gospel has two parts. And they both, both parts of that gospel have to be known and understood to obtain that, sa that uh, saving faith. In the first part, the kingdom of God, that will have to be a topic for another lecture, or we'll be here for four hours instead of two. But the other part is the one I want to focus on, because that's one part that a lot of the churches around us get wrong. But it's the part that we have to know. It's 50% of the gospel. The things concerning the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 4 and 12 tells us there is none other name, Jesus Christ, there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tells us, it explains to us how that name was given. If you read through the, the record of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that tells us the story of the life of Jesus Christ in his mortality that tells us how that name was given. And God was well pleased with Christ. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30 tells us Christ of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. In his manifestation, crucifixion, and his resurrection. That is the story of the name of Jesus Christ. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In the way to salvation... Galatians 3.27, as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's the way. Philippians 3 and 9, to be found in him. So if we put on Christ, we're no longer naked. We're not, no longer naked in the natural man. We have put on Christ. We, want, we identify with him through baptism. So that we have put on Christ. And as many as have been baptized into Christ have put him on. Philippians 3 and 9. And to be found in him. Not having mine own righteousness which is of the law. But that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. So both the, king, the things concerning the kingdom of God. And the things concerning the name of Jesus Christ. They have to be understood they have to be understood to be believed. And they have to be understood in truth. And the immortality of the soul absolutely destroys what Christ accomplished in, that, in the story of how his name was given. If you try and make the immortality of the soul fit, it just does not fit. It actually destroys what Christ accomplished 
in his crucifixion, in his life, and in his resurrection. First, uh, 2 Timothy 1 and 10, who hath abolished death, Christ, who hath abolished death, and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. There's an immortal soul. How did he bring life to light? How did he bring immortality to light if we already had it? Hebrews 2 and 9 tells us he was made a little lower than than the angels. Why? For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So we have to understand the truth of the matter. The truth has to be received. And again, there's more in hell than in heaven. It's just not working. If Under the reign of the immortality of the soul, it makes no sense. There's more people going wrong than going right. And they're living forever being tormented. That makes It's absolutely illogical. This doctrine is a doctrine of devils. It has to be removed. We have to remove that doctrine and look at what the scripture says. It must be removed. So just to recap, the base condition of salvation, the basis of salvation is a definite belief. It's a definite belief based in knowledge and in faith. And the beauty is that that's what the human mind was made for. God designed the human mind. And it instilled in us, our Father in heaven instilled in us a desire for higher satisfaction. And we look at these doctrines of immortality of the soul and we're like, that just doesn't satisfy. But when you look at the story of the Bible, it is absolutely satisfying. Why? Because the creator of our minds designed these things to be so. The truth makes sense. And where's the satisfaction and glory that if somebody live in their life just being good, they're granted entrance into his kingdom. The things concerning the kingdom of God. They're granted entrance. What satisfaction would that mind have if it never anticipated that reward? Or those promises. The unfulfilled promises are fulfilled. And they wake up one day and they're in the kingdom and they're like, this isn't. There's just no satisfaction. There's no glory to God in that. God has much bigger plans for us. He has much bigger plans for this world. And it's based in a definite belief, a definite knowledge, and it's based in a definite faith, a one faith. So God provides more satisfaction. God provides more hope. What is God doing? What is he doing now? He's preparing a people through the preaching of the gospel. And the world absolutely scoffs at this. 1 Peter 2 and 9. He's making ready a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people to show forth the praises of him who hath called them out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Colossians 3 and 10, the people he is preparing on the principle of putting on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Colossians 1 verse 9, filling them with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. God is trying to create, to to draw out a people for his name, a peculiar people through knowledge, through faith, through belief in what God is able to do, through hope. So knowing a faithful obedience to the will of God is the best. It's the best thing we can imagine. In the world, but there are specific things that are true, that we have to know, and the world protests against this as, as bigotry, or as being dogmatic. How can you know this is true? 
But the enlightened conscience, the one that's enlightened by the word of God, accepts it and knows it to be true. John 6, verse 63, not in the wisdom of men, but in the word. The words, they are spirit, they are life. And as we, as we mentioned earlier, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. He that reject, John 12, 48, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So the word, the Bible, is the guide in all our decisions before us. The Bible is our guide to where, we sh where we're supposed to go. The word tells us where to go. And where are we to go? Where are we to go? We can either go down the straight and narrow way, which is the basis of favorable judgment. That's where we're supposed to go. The straight and narrow way. And we're told this in Luke 9, to some, of the, some verses to show us what that straight and narrow way is. Luke 9, 23. Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. 1 Corinthians 3, 18 and 19. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. That's the broad way, the wisdom of this world. And we're, we're commanded, the apostles were commanded in Mark 16, to go ye into the world. So the popular sentiment of the world around us is just be good. Just be moral and you'll be okay. That's all you need to worry about. Just be good. And it's either, it's, it's either, it's either true or false. It's not like the, you can say, yeah, they both work together because what we're saying is there's something you have to do. The world is saying, just be good, the broad way. Generally in this direction, go over here, you'll be happy. Everyone around you will be happy. Just go that way. And what we're saying, what the Bible is saying, there is a straight and narrow way. Walk in it. So it's either one way or the other. There's no neutral ground. You're either in the straight and narrow way, you're in the wide way. You can't be in both at the same time. So it's either there are, there are specific requirements or there's just general feelings. Right? So there's, again, accept the Bible. So we can either accept what the Bible says and all of the related arguments, or we can discard the Bible and be without hope. So we can either do what the Bible says or we can do not what the Bible says and be without hope. And actually, we might be accountable even on that path. So where's the basis that virtue will secure a reward? What, give me a chapter and a verse that says, if you're good, you will be saved. That's all you have to do and nothing else. Where is the basis of that belief? Where's the basis that virtue secures a reward? Just where? Virtue will profit nothing in relation to future promises. 1 John 5 and 10 tells us, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. Again, we come back to belief. Belief in what? Something specific. Something you know. He that believes on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believes not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So again, belief is the key. And it's incredible because we can't help believing in something. We all believe in something. Belief is the mainspring of intelligent action. If you're going to do something, it's because you believe in a result. At one point in time, they believed the world was flat. They actually believed 
the world was flat. And if you deviated from that, then it was foolishness. But that belief was based on a knowledge because they knew things. But now we know more things. So now we know the world is round. So why do we believe the world is round? Because we know things about the world. We have pictures from a satellite. We have shadows with poles and things like that. There's ways to prove things, but those things make us know things. And so now we believe the world is round. And it's the same with evolution. We be, they believe that monkey, monkeys made man or, or whatever. It's like, where's the proof? It's, it's just as ridiculous as the world being flat. It's just based on what they think they know. The man who says the world is flat, he thinks he knows the world is flat. And that's what he believes. So the point is, to believe something, you have to know it. You can't believe something you don't know. Does that make sense? So, it's accepted as fact concerning non-scriptural things. As it's just a fact. If you believe something, you have to know it. I mean, that's just scientific. You have to prove it, right? Why does it not apply spiritually? Why does that principle not apply to the Word of God? To know something. It's foolish to have a double standard, but that's what the world has concerning the Word of God. The issue lies between belief and unbelief. We have all these struggles about conservatives, liberals, but that's not the struggle. The struggle has to do with belief and unbelief. You either believe what God said, or you don't. You either believe that God spoke these words, or you don't. It's, it's that simple. And once you believe it, well, this, one of the reasons you might not believe it, or you might reject it, would be because the Broadway just feels better. It feels better to go down the Broadway than to stay in the narrow way. And it takes effort to search out the truth of the matter. We actually have to open the book and read it to find the truth of the matter. So the truth is that belief has to come first. And then there has to be an action. And that action, the first action, is baptism. Present day Christians ignore this. They say, well, if you want to get baptized, full immersion, you can. I actually sat down with a Mennonite priest the other day and asked him, do you baptize? And they say, well, if they want to. But if they're afraid of water, we don't make them. That's like, yeah, do 10 jumping jacks and they'll be all right. You'll, you'll be okay. Just, no. But that's, that's the state. I'm, he sat there and told me that. Oh. We believe something. We believe the gospel. We believe that baptism is necessary. Full immersion is necessary upon belief of the gospel. So first you have to know something so that you can believe it. Once you believe it, the commandment is to be baptized. And this is the commandment. I'm just going to give you six scriptural examples to show how emphatic the Bible is that baptism is necessary. It's not an option if it makes you feel good. The Bible says it's absolutely necessary. Acts 2, verses 37, 38, and 41 tells us, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Let's turn that up. Acts 2, so we have it in front of us. There's nothing more powerful than seeing the words on the page before you. Acts 2, verse 37 Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, 
every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In verse 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Acts 8 and 12. We already read this earlier, but I just want to read it again in the context of baptism. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Acts 10, 47. This is the story of Cornelius. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? They have received the Holy Spirit as well as we. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they to tarry certain days. So there's baptism. What can any man forbid water? Let's look at Acts 22, verse 16. And this is Paul. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So again, I'm just what I'm trying to emphasize here is how clear scripture is that baptism after coming to a knowledge is absolutely mandatory. It's not an option. Um, Acts 16 verse 33 is talking about um, the Philippian jailer. And that's where the title of, our, title of our lecture comes from today. Acts 16 verse 33 and he took them, that's the Philippian jailer, took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And the ultimate example of the submission to baptism is in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 3, where he says, thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Christ himself submitted to the ordinance of baptism. So scripture it's absolutely clear in this. It's absolutely clear in the need for baptism. It's also very clear on the effects of baptism. What does actually going under the water and come out do? What's the effect of being baptized? Galatians 3.27, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So the act of baptism is a way to put on Christ. Colossians 2, 11, verses 11 and 12. And whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. It's faith in the operation of God. Romans 6, 3 through 6. Know ye not that so many as of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. And Peter tells us about Noah and the ark when he says, even he compares Noah and the ark and his journey in the flooded earth with us, even in baptism even as baptism doth also now save us, just like the waters saved Noah in the flood, even so does baptism now save us. That's 1 Peter 3, verse 20 and 21. 
So unlike Christianity, the the apostles, they saw very much significance in this ordinance of baptism. It's not optional. It's the next step after belief. They saw very much, and that effect of baptism was to put off Adam, to put off the old man, and to put on Christ. It's a new standing in the sight of God. And some might think it's strange and trivial to be baptized, to be dunked in a tub of water. It's a very strange thing to do. It's not something, I mean, we take showers and baths, but that has a purpose, to get us clean so we don't get sick and spread disease. But this ritual of baptism, some think it's very foolish. Some. But to the earnest mind absorbed with the scripture who sees how important the importance and the weight that the Bible puts on this ordinance of baptism, they're satisfied that it's the will of God. Baptism is the will of God. And they're satisfied with that. It's one of the characteristics of God's dealings with men that he selects those weak things, those strange things, the despised things, yea, the things that are not. That's, those are the things that God chooses. Why? That the faith might be in God's abilities, not in the things that we do, like looking at a serpent on a pole. That, that, that's what they looked at to save them. That doesn't do anything. Looking at a serpent on a pole doesn't do anything physically. It's like going into a tub of water and coming out. It doesn't do anything physically to help to save them. But what it does do is show that the faith is in God's ability to save. Like Naaman washing in the Jordan. It shows an obedience to God. God says to do it. To obey is better than sacrifice. To hearken than the fat of rams. 1 Samuel 15 and 22, that's where that verse is on the screen. So to obey, that's what we're requested to do by the offer of the refuge from the storm. He asks us to obey. And from a human point of view, that request is unlikely. It's, it's a little strange, but the more severe the test the more visible the obedience. For example, Abraham was called to sacrifice his son on Mount Moriah, to kill his only son. That's a very unlikely request. It's a very strange thing to ask someone to do, especially when you've made promises to, to that man through that seed. But the more unlikely the request the more visible is the obedience. Okay, like Joshua slaying the whole nation as he goes into the land of Canaan. He was obedient to the command of the Lord. God said to do it, and he did it. And it's the same with us today with baptism. The Bible says, be fully immersed, and we obey. That's what we do. Hebrews 2 tells us that we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word that was spoken of by angels, and that's talking about the law given through the disposition of angels, if that word was steadfast, the things that the angels said in the Old Testament were steadfast, in every transgression and disobedience under that law received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord? Jesus came and spoke these things. If we neglect those things, how are we going to escape? And those things that our Lord Jesus Christ, the things that the Lord spoke, they were confirmed to us by them that heard him. Through the word. So even though Jesus says the yoke is easy and the burden is light, 
the apostles teach that the obligation is critical. To obey is absolutely critical. It's dangerous to tinker with what is required and say, you don't need to do that. You don't need to understand the truth. You don't need to follow the ordinances and the commands. That's very dangerous ground. Just be good. You'll be fine. That's very dangerous ground to be on when the word tells us what we are to do. It requires one hope, one faith, and one baptism. And that's the only acceptable offering God will accept. Anything else we try and offer is just strange fire. If we could dream up whatever, uh, I think I want to give fruit instead. I don't want to get baptized. I'm just going to put an apple on the table. I'll be saved. That's strange fire. That's dreaming things up, and that's very dangerous ground to stand on, especially if you realize the need to be saved. Man is mortal. You will die. What must we do to be saved? So it requires baptism as a means from transferring from that old dominion, the dominion of death under Adam, to being under the dominion of life, to be in Christ. Requires baptism. But the eye of sense, it's like it, I just can't understand a reason. Why do I have to be baptized? Why do I have to be fully immersed? The people, if you don't know, you can't believe, right? But now you say, well, I know I need to be baptized because I read all those verses. I still don't understand a reason for it. And again, submission is a test of obedience. It's the first step. And it's more God-honoring than any fact, any act of necessity. Right? It's more honoring to obey God than it is to do something that makes sense to us. To obey, even though it's a little strange, is better. It's like Naaman. He washed in the Jordan. He said, no, no, you know what? I'm not washing in that dirty river. I'm washing in the one back at home because it's clean and it's big and it's strong. And his servant said, look, if he's told you to do that, you would do it. He told you to do this. And Naaman submitted to that. He obeyed that commandment to be baptized. And he received salvation. But there is a physical change. There is a physical change in baptism. And that change comes from faith. And it's faith in the operation of God. We may accept that as a little child. We have to have faith in His ability to save. And that's why we go through the waters of baptism. Without faith, there's no use in being baptized. And you can't have faith in something you don't know. You can't believe something you don't know. So we have faith in the operation of God. We have to have that childlike faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. And that faith in him will lead to baptism. It's essential, or else Jesus wouldn't have done it. And God never exhorted people to be baptized until you believe. Be baptized until you believe. It's belief and then baptism. Belief. And then baptism. So the character of the act of baptism depends on the person being baptized. Right? So if the person being baptized has faith, then that baptism is effective. But if that person being baptized has no faith, then they can get baptized every day of the week forever. And it makes no difference because there's no belief. There's no faith. You have to be um, 
belief predicates baptism. In Ephesians 5 and 26, even as Christ also loved the church, gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of the water of the word. When the word is missing, it's missing that cleansing agent and the subject remains unwashed. And that's the condition of vast multitudes who have performed this religious ordinance. They actually do go through waters of baptism, but they don't have the cleansing agent. What is that cleansing agent? It's the word. Washing of the water by the word. This word is the source of what is believed. It's the source of faith. If you don't have that, then the water of baptism is ineffective. And we see an example of this just as a side note. We're not going to look at it, but Acts 19. Um, there's a group of people who were baptized into John's baptism. And they had to be re-baptized. Well, if, yeah. Anyway, we're not going to get into that. So, <laughs> they had to be re-baptized because they learned something more. Their faith was made sure. So, again, in a summary... The person who asks, what must I do to be saved? There's only one answer. There's one answer to that question. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. What must I do to be saved? Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And once that is yielded, once you do that, you're entered into the name of Christ. You've put on Christ. And at that point, sins can be forgiven. The forgiveness of sins can be obtained. Luke 20, I believe it's on the screen, Luke 20, 35 and 36. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world. Those who are accounted worthy to be saved. And the re- they're account- accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead. They're neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of resurrection. Remember the baptism coming out of the water. They are children of that resurrection, just like the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans eight twenty two and twenty five. They were waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of the body. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man sees, why doth he yet hope for it? But if we hope for that we see not, Then do we with patience wait for it. And what are those things that we don't see? Love, peace, mercy, joy. That's what we hope for. The refuge from the storm. However, ultimate acceptance in the kingdom of God depends on the character that is developed after obedience to baptism. John 6, 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. It's the fruit of the spirit versus the works of the flesh. So our motive, why we do what we do, that's the basis of judgment. Are we motivated by the words that he spake unto us? Because they are spirit and they are life. Where are those words that he spoke to us? So the faithful must continue in bringing forth faithful fruit. How do we do that? We have to know what's required. We must know what we must do. And that's revealed in the word of God. And there are commandments of Christ. Those commandments that he gave must be observed. We have to, what must we do to be saved? We have to submit to the conditions of the one who can save you. It's that simple. What must I do to be saved? Submit to the conditions of the one who can save you. And what are those conditions? 
to believe, to have faith. Faith in what? In the gospel. To keep his commandments, the first of which is to be baptized, to put on Christ, to obtain the forgiveness of sins. And then continue in the commandments of Christ to walk as he walked. And hereby do we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. We need to follow in the footsteps, the straight and narrow way. And what are those steps? Again, just to recap, these are the steps. We start in unbelief. We learn the gospel. We believe the gospel, the good news, the hope. We learn, we we are filled with the knowledge of the things concerning the kingdom of God and the things concerning the name of Jesus Christ. That knowledge leads us to be baptized. And after that baptism, we keep the memorial. Week by week, we come here together and keep his commandments And we continue daily in his commandments. And we walk as he walked. And in this position, if we are doing that, when he comes, in that position, we will be invited as good and faithful servants to enter into the kingdom. And that is the true refuge from the storm.